Assalamu alaikum. We now move on to the brain stems. A lot what we'll do here will overlap with what we've done in the spinal cord. As I mentioned, the ascending and descending tracks, when they pass through the spinal cord, they will also pass through the brain stem. You'll see all of them at certain regions of the brain stem. Moreover, we'll also be looking at the cranial nerves. A little uh, brief overview, because that is a separate chapter. But the whole brain stem functionally serves three purposes. Number one, it allows the passage of the tracts. Two, it holds the center of respiration and the cardiovascular activity, the beating of the heart. And thirdly, the source of all the nerves, well, nerves number three to 12, as one and two come from the brain. For the first part, we'll only be looking at the medulla, oblongata. That is the one right at the bottom. Now, let's first clear up all this clutter so we can focus on the gross features. Now, I'm going to just go step by step back and we'll re-enable all of them once we reach there. Moving the arteries and the nerves and the last nerve here. Now, the whole brain stem has a very cylindrical type structure but if you look at the medulla oblongata the one at the bottom you will notice about four elevations in front these two <coughs> elevations are known as the pyramids the reason we call them the pyramids is because these this is where the pyramidal tract pass through and as you, if you remember from last time there was only one pyramidal tract the corticospinal tract both the lateral and the anterior corticospinal as they pass through here, they will then decussate down further and then continue downward to supply the muscles of your hand and feet, the fine muscles. Here is you have your anterior median fissure which continues with the spinal cord down below. So these were the two elevations in front. To the side, this right here is your olives just like over here we have the olives here this is an impression made by the inferior olivary complex which is a group of nuclei and they are called the olives if you remember from the tracts we did a tract known as the spino olivary and the olivospinal this is where that tract synapses with the nucleus again this is the impression of the nucleus the nucleus is actually on the inside so you have the pyramids, the olives. And on the back side, if you see over here, you can see, although not that very clear, two more impressions. These bumps you see here, these are the impressions of two more nuclei known as the <coughs> nucleus gracilis and the nucleus um, cuneatus. These are the nuclei for the posterior a white uh, column tract. When that tract entered into the spinal cord, it then synapsed with the nuclear propius and from there it went to the posterior column. From the posterior column of the spinal cord it sends upwards all the way from this region. So basically you can call this the fasciculus gracilis medially and the fasciculus uh, cuneatus laterally. If, uh, if you were to clarify it for you. So over here, let me clarify it for you. Let's use a red color. No, let's use a purple. We used purple last time too. There's no purple here. That's all right. Here we have the nucleus gracilis, and here we have the nucleus cuneatus. You can see both of them. Down below, this right here is the fasciculus gracilis, and this right here is your fasciculus cuneatus. Up above, let's clear this. As we go up, although they have not rendered it over here, here we have the fourth ventricle. This is the space between the medulla pons in front and the cerebellum back. There's supposed to be a stria medullaris uh, um, nerves here but they have not rendered them but that's okay 
what else is visible here are these things you can see these small uh, depressions made on the medulla this serves as a landmark for the inferior cerebellar peduncle it connects with the cerebellum on the back there are actually three peduncles superior middle and inferior and it is through these peduncles that you have the passage of the spinocerebellar tract that we did last time just for your clarity let me make the cerebellum visible so that you can see and you can also see the peduncles as well here we go okay over here well in any case you can see the cerebellum on the back side you can see this space right here is where you have the fourth ventricle filled with the CSF it communicates superiorly via cerebral aqueduct into the third ventricle and down below it goes into the central canal of the spinal cord and uh, here we go. Now, what other parts are visible here? The impression made here on the top part of the ventricle is known as your hypoglossal triangle. That is because the nucleus gives a small bump visible here. It's not that apparent, but that's what we have here. And down below we have the vagus triangle. So grossly, these are the parts of the medulla. If we were to take a look at the cross section, there are actually four levels of the medulla that you have to learn to draw, especially for your prof. They ask this in the SAQ is to draw a section of the medulla at the level of the decussation of the pyramids, at the level of the decussation of the medial lemonisci, and the upper two levels. So the easiest way to do that is stepwise, like so. I'm just going to use black for now and keep it extremely thin okay here you have once again the central canal which extends downwards at the level of the decussation of the pyramids now over here the first thing you need to draw are two large nuclei laterally these are your spino cerebellar Nu uh, tracts, the anterior and posterior spinal cerebellar tracts. It is through here that you have those tracts passing through as they go up and they enter into the cerebellum via the peduncles. The spinal cerebellar tracts, both anterior and posterior. Now, using a different color, in between we have a nucleus spinothalamic. This is the same one which was involved in pain and temperature sensation. But keep in mind, it was composed of two parts, lateral and anterior. Both combine and pass through this place as they ascend upwards. And having done that, we move on to the top part right here. I'll use a blue this time. There is actually a nucleus and a tract here. So I'm going to draw a double layer like so and fill in the nucleus while keeping the tract a bit clear. This nucleus is your trigeminal nucleus or to be more specific, one part of that nucleus, the mesencephalic part, sorry, the spinal part which extends down below. And this is the tract, the trigeminal tract of the trigeminal nucleus. The trigeminal is one of the largest nuclei in the brainstem and because of it has three parts, the spinal part extends all the way down below through the medulla into the spinal cord. And now let's use cyan for the decussation of the pyramidal tracts. As the corticospinal tracts descend downwards, at this point they will decussate. It's the inferior most part and this is where the decussation is happening here you can see the fibers crossing so here we have the decussation of the pyramids
Now, the only thing rema remaining here, well, actually, we got in the major parts, but there are a lot of smaller things that you need to draw. I'm not going to mention them here as because those are, well, to make a whole complete section of your medulla, it's all well and good. If you can draw at least the major parts, then that should be enough to get you most of the marks. So if you can draw the decussation of the pyramid, the spinothalamic, spinocerebellar, trigeminal right here, up above basically, if you go even further up, there will be a slight difference. That difference being, if I were to just erase this, the only difference from here and a one level up above would be that instead of decussation of the pyramids, you have the decussation of the medial lemonisci. And they look like this. Here you had the nucleus gracilis and the nucleus cuneatus. Let's draw a dot right here to represent both of them. And here they're crossing over like so. We have two on the same side as well. So I drew the trigeminal nucleus large. Didn't have space to draw them, but just bear with it. Here you can see the decussation of the medial lemonisci. That, that would be the difference from down below and above. And one further thing, that level is where you'll also appreciate the hypoglossal and the accessory nerve. Hypoglossal nerve we're passing out like so, and it will extend between the pyramid and olive. And I'll show you that grossly when we see the front. While the accessory will be Sorry, I behind the olives like so. Now, just to give it a nice finishing touch, since at the bottom level we had the decussation of the pyramids, superiorly, we're just going to draw a simple pyramidal tract like so. so. This would be your pyramidal tract. And obviously, it will be too bright. I can't uh, use yellow here. You won't see it against the white. But just know that this is your pyramidal tract. Decussation down happens below. At this level, you have decussation of the medial lemonisci. Now, let's finish off the medulla by looking at the nerves themselves and the blood supply. For that, let's look at the nerves one by one. Again, I won't go into details because they have their own chapter, but just to see their positions. And we'll see if we can also cover the clinicals alongside. Now, the first nerve you need to see is the hypoglossal nerve. The hypoglossal nerve, as I said, comes between the pyramids and the olives, right over here. Notice, you can see the rootlets between the two uh, pyramid and the olive. And the hypoglossal nerve will extend forward, passing through the hypoglossal canal of the skull. And it will then go and supply the tongue, the muscles of the tongue. That is where you have the motor supply of the tongue coming from. The hypoglossal nerve is a motor supply to the tongue. And just for a little added uh, effect, let's just make the tongue visible. Hmm, don't see it here. It's alright, let's leave it. Oh, over there, sorry. There we go. Here you can nicely see how the hypoglossal nerve is supplying the tongue. Okay, the next nerve is the accessory nerve. The accessory nerve, this will be the cranial part. If you remember, when I was drawing the nucleuses of the, in the spinal cord, there was a spinal part of the accessory nerve. As you can see here, down below, you can see the accessory nerve actually coming out from the spinal cord region. This is the, your spinal part. Right up above here from the medulla, this is your cranial part. And you can see how it goes upwards and then down again. The accessory nerves will supply only two muscles, sternocleidomastoid and the trapeze. It's a purely motor. But here's the interesting part. The nerve itself is different and it supplies the muscles, but the nuclei of the accessory nerve is the same for vagus and glossopharyngeal as well. <coughs> And here I'll show them both. Here we have the vagus, which has a whole lot of function. Aside from autonomic function as well, it has motor and sensory. And you can see how the accessory is going right alongside with the vagus. And finally, glossopharyngeal. I'm 
and the glossopharyngeal as well. Glossopharyngeal and the vagus are both going to be behind the olive. You can see that the glossopharyngeal has two of its own ganglia, the vagus has its own ganglia visible. But the point I was trying to make was that all of the sensations from these, uh, sorry, the motor supply comes from the same nucleus in the medulla. We'll come to that nucleus later. So these are the nerves which are from the medulla, the important nerves. Whenever you think of a paralysis of your sternocleidomastoid trapezius, think accessory and think maybe there's a lesion at the medulla. It could be a lesion at the nerve itself, but when we're talking about the brain stem and the central nervous system, that's where you will consider it. Likewise, if there's an infarction of the central nervous system and then your tongue is affected, you would think medulla. Anyway, let's finish off by drawing the blood supply. Now the blood supply, if you remember, when we were doing the spinal cord, we did two vertebral arteries and those arteries, as they ascend upward, they combine to form the basilar artery. It is the vertebral artery which supplies the medial part of the medulla as well as the anterior spinal artery. Here we have the anterior spinal. So if you have lesions in the medial part, supposedly if the anterior spinal is blocked or the vertebral artery is blocked. If you remember, this is where you had the pyramids. So a lesion here, a blockage here of the artery would result in paralysis of both sides of the body unless there was only one vertebral artery involved. In that case, it would be the opposite size because the corticospinal decussate. Another artery that you need to see here are the cerebellar. While they are called cerebellar, since they pass by over the medulla, they supply the structures in the adjacent territory as well. And they include the anterior spinal and the posterior. Here we have the posterior inferior cerebellar. And this supplies the lateral part of the medulla. And this is how you can see how these two will form the medial medullary syndrome and the posterior inferior cerebellar will form the lateral medullary syndrome if they are affected. And what are the nuclei here? As you can plainly see the posterior column tract as well as at this level you'll see there is the vagus and the glossopharyngeal as well. So you'll have problems with the oral cavity gag reflex and so on and so forth. So this is just a small overview of the medulla one section we've also drawn. I've shown the arteries and the nerves. The last section we'll do next time, which is the section up above right here. At the level of the inferior olivary complex, how do we draw a section there? You need to learn how to draw all four sections. Last two are actually quite similar. So if you learn one, it's enough. So three sections you need to learn for the medulla for your prof.